dashboard of this computer. There's now far too many buttons in, in the Zoom toolbar for me to remember anything at all. There, there's the screen share. Two. Nope. Okay. Cool. And I need to turn off closed captioning here. There we go. So welcome. I see a many names I recognize and some I don't, which is always good. Welcome to the first meeting of the year for the Astronomy Fundamentals Group. Give me one moment to do some things for this data recovery that just went to a continue point. I apologize for the disruption. Uh, so this month, uh, kind of in our continuing session of trying to get some of the more equipment focused presentations recorded for new members as they want to join or people who are wanting to learn more about some of the fundamental stuff as they're looking like I want new equipment I don't know what I'm what I want to get I don't know what I should get it's trying to help or answer some of those questions or maybe for those who have a telescope or aren't quite sure what they have or what the pros and cons of their equipment might be so uh hopefully going to answer some of that not all of it tonight there is quite a bit to this topic in general uh, there's just a lot going on so this should hopefully be at least a good orientation ground for those who are, who are looking to get their first scope or have their first scope but don't quite know all about it or what's all in it uh, when, okay there we go so we're going to look at uh, a couple of things. We're going to look at some core characteristics. These are the attributes of telescopes that are shared or similar amongst all the different types. They're the, the main uh, things you look for in addition to some of the more type-specific qualities, which we'll get to in a moment. Then we will talk first about refractors, uh, the classic... Galilean telescope that we all know and love, followed by reflectors, uh, which were first conceived by Isaac Newton. And then catadioptric, which is a really fancy word, uh, but really it's just saying that we're going to look at a telescope that uses both lenses and mirrors, or some combination of. Uh, and then we're also going to briefly talk the uh, a little bit about choosing a telescope mount, which is kind of an essential component of your overall setup in addition with your eyepieces, your finder scope, and your filters. Some of those topics, which we covered previously in eyepieces was most recently uh, here in December. I don't think we've, I think we've done one on filters, but I would need to go back and double check my list or if there has been, it's been a very long time. So, I keep hitting spacebar on a keyboard that's not hooked up to my laptop. So the first thing we're going to look at for our telescope is, a, is what's known as the aperture. This is essentially how big the mirror or, uh, or uh, lens that collects all the light. So in a, refract in a refractor, this is the big lens at the front of the scope where light enters. In a reflector, this is the giant mirror at the back of the telescope that reflects all the light back to the eyepiece. This is the main measure of a telescope's gathering power. And general rule of thumb is larger is always better. Uh, it can make uh, your the objects that you're looking at that are dim uh, more readily visible, especially for those who might be observing from here within Tucson, which has somewhat like polluted skies. Uh, it also affects a couple of other things that are all positive. And this aperture is something that is usually expressed in millimeters or inches. It depends on your scope. For example, my personal scope is an 8-inch Celestron, uh, which is what you will mostly see re uh, reflectors mentioned as. They'll all usually be given in inches if you're here in the U.S. If you're in Europe, it will generally be given in centimeters. 
of um and where you will see uh millimeters come into play is more on refractors that are typically below the four inch mark so those will typically be given in millimeters like 190 millimeters uh of aperture you know 80 millimeters of aperture and you also find that finder scopes will also often be described uh in terms of millimeter aperture because it's just a smaller unit of measure and it makes um you know it's better than saying this is a 1.35 inch you know finder scope it 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 makes it sound a little bit more some of it's a little bit of a marketing ploy on, on scope manufacturers as well you could argue from there the next big thing we look at is the focal length this is when you're using an eyepiece or it's an or a camera this is the main statistic that is used to determine what the scope's overall magnification is going to be as well as its field of view the higher your focal length, sorry, the longer your focal length, the deeper your magnification can be uh, at the cost of you have a smaller field of view. It's just an, an, an just a general trade-off with anything when you're trying to magnify something. More magnification, less field of view. This will almost always be given in millimeters. <laughs> Was that, did you have a comment, Doug? No, no, I'm just, okay. my sinuses are giving me trouble today. No, no worries. And, um, but the trade-off with longer focal length is that uh, the higher magnification can make it a little bit trickier for novices to set up. They're not used to the smaller field of view when they're trying to find alignment stars for those of you that may want to look at a go-to telescope mount, which we'll talk about near the end of this presentation. Um, but the you would typically want to use a higher focal length telescope for doing something like, say, uh, planetary observing or individual star observing uh, versus a shorter focal length telescope with a wider field of view is better for some deep sky objects uh, like star clusters or some large nebulae, like, for example, ten, uh, Messier 42, which is currently reaching uh, some good viewing positions for this time of year and is definitely one of the best uh, objects to look at in the northern hemisphere so in summary longer focal length more magnification at a trade-off of field of view from there we need to consider uh, a derived metric which is known as the focal ratio this is calculated uh Basically, it's the focal length of your telescope in millimeters divided by the aperture of your telescope in millimeters, and that tells you uh, this number. You'll typically see this also uh, communicated separately when you're looking at telescope uh, specifications, uh, but it's just worth saying, that, uh, trying to quantify exactly what this number is telling us. So what this is trying to tell you when you're looking at your telescope is how quickly your telescope will gather light to the uh end to the uh not the objective uh the eyepiece or into your camera sensor this is typically expressed as a fraction of you know f 4.3 or f 10. this is also something you will find on camera lenses your iphone itself also has an f ratio it's just an inherent thing of any optical system uh, this is uh, a value that, you know, the smaller the number on the bottom that's closer to one, the faster and more light and more intense the light will be that reaches uh, your eyepiece. The larger the number, for example, F10 in this case, in this example here on the slide, is uh, slower to gather light. Um, this sometimes is or isn't a perceptible thing to the human eye but it can help when looking at very faint objects if you're having to have your eyepiece, uh, your, your eye up to an eyepiece for an extended period of time. Uh, for those who maybe are interested in photography, uh, the faster the telescope, in this case, like an F4.3 is very fast. Uh, the less time you'll have to expend uh, uh, exposing a single target to get a meaningful volume of data. So. Mm. Uh, in general, for a scope range, I think this is my next slide. Hey, it is. I'm ahead of myself. Uh, 
so uh, this is kind of the best diagram I could find that kind of helped express what I was trying to get at. Um, circling a little bit back to photography, uh, mostly just because this is where some of this originally came from, I think, uh, is the, the stop, is you may see this referred to in photography uh, parlance as the stop number. And for every uh, increase in the stop number, which is showing here, uh, the typical stop numbers you would see on camera lenses, but for our purpose, it's, it's roughly the same. Uh, uh, the amount of light reaching the your set, your eye, or the centerpiece is cut in half. Oh, sorry, is um is cut in is cut in by a fourth because you're reducing the diameter essentially. If you can think of it this way, uh, the diagram here is showing um, a diaphragm inside of a camera lens that is shrinking and reducing in, uh, in order to limit the amount of light. And so by shrinking the, um, by having the stop number, we're reducing the amount of light by four. It's, it's a math thing uh, related to uh, you know the inverse square law. So uh, the typical speed that you'll, tip it, uh, you'll see when you're chopping for telescopes typically range for about F4 to F10. Uh, for those of us who were you have a Smith Cassegrain. These are almost all. These are always F10 telescopes. Um, sometimes F11 for the really large aperture Smith Cassegrains. Uh, Newtonians typically fall into a flavor of being a very fast F4 up to F8, and similarly for refractors. Um, and uh, there's also dedicated imaging telescopes uh, such as uh, recently gaining popularity RASA or the Hyperstar, which will turn a telescope into an F2. Uh, but those are not generally for visual observing. And we like to keep uh, a lot of these conversations centered around visual observings here and in this particular group. So you don't, you won't, we won't go too much into F, F2, but there, there are some concepts here between that do relate to each other. The other thing, uh, our next statistic is what's termed as back focus. This is one that always, whenever I have to research about it for my own, when I'm looking at accessories, I always have to remember exactly what it means uh, or exactly how it impacts things. So it's it's something you should know about, but in general for visual isn't necessarily too important like it might be for photography, but it's still worth talking about. And it generally comes into play when you have what are, uh, uh, is known as a corrected optics system, or you are using certain types of accessories. Uh, so a, in a corrected optic system, there's additional pieces and glass that are meant to correct for certain types of, of aberrations. We'll talk about some of them here later. Uh, that are inherent to a specific telescope design <clears throat> in order to make what you're looking at um, more representative of you know you know for example round stars throughout the whole field of view or you're getting a smooth um image across the whole eyepiece in addition to that it also comes into play for certain accessories like focal reducers and coma correctors uh so and the short version i don't think i think i have a diagram on the next slide i got too many things open so i can't see some of the stuff uh i do not oh darn I thought I had an image of this. It's basically the amount of space between the accessory, where light comes out of the accessory, so in this case, like the back end of a focal reducer, and your eyepiece or your camera. And if your eyepiece is not at that distance, so let's say I my new camera that I recently got has a back focus distance of 55 millimeters. This means that if my camera sensor isn't placed 55 millimeters away from the exit plane of a focal reducer, that I won't be getting the full advantage of the capability of that focal reducer. It will introduce... Oh, that's an interesting question, David. I will get. I will read that out here in a second. Uh, it will introduce... Uh, imperfections, typically around the fringes of the field of view, uh, that will basically mean you're not using the accessory to its full potential. Um, or in the case of a coma corrector, which is another accessory that would be impacted by this, 
Uh, you won't you won't have perfectly round stars near the field near the edges of the field of view. Uh, so it's the same thing if it's too far or if it's too close. If it's not if, if not within that distance, you know you're not taking full advantage of this. Um, so there are sometimes your camera will say it needs a back focus distance of X. So for example, my camera says it needs a back focus distance of 55 millimeters. But the general requirement is not that you should not the camera or the eyepiece back focus distance. Um, it's usually the accessory in which case. So you want to look at what the accessories back focus distance is and use that as the primary measure. Now, in some cases, uh, you know, you'll find that you're, you're, uh, you might not have enough spacing between the two. Um, so like, let's say I might, my camera has only 21 millimeters of back focus distance. I can buy individual spacers, uh, generally from the manufacturer of the camera or from, you know, another vendor like say Star Arizona here in town in order to get your eyepiece or your camera to that, that critical optimal back focus distance. Uh, and so to answer, to get to Doug's question, he asked, if you wear glasses, does the back focus distance matter considering how close your eye can get to the eyepiece with your glasses on? So the, I, I'm not a hundred percent sure on that, but I will, my, when I think about it out loud, David, what comes to mind is that once the eyepiece has focused that light, that's, so the light's going to enter, exit out of that eyepiece through the through whatever um, lens or your or looking glass that you're going to have, that once that light reaches there, that that's essentially a, a light, a travel distance, if you want to think about it. So I, on the surface, your eyeglasses should not be a factor in that calculation because it's looking, it's, it's once it gets to the end of the eyepiece, that's it. And, but what will come into play for you, for those who are wearing glasses, is more um, the exit pupil diameter. So you don't have to try to say, well, my eyepiece needs a back, I need a back focus distance of 35 millimeters and I'm wearing glasses, so how does that, it doesn't really impact as long as your eyepiece can get within that, you know, 55 millimeters in this example, you'll be fine even with glasses. Does that help answer your question? Yeah, thanks, okay. yes. That is an excellent thing. I always, since I do not wear glasses for myself, I often forget that uh, a good number, good number of people do, and sometimes forget some of the questions that they might need to be answered. So thank you for asking. So uh, the next major thing to consider with the scope is what's known as the field orientation. So each type of scope we'll talk about tonight has a unique field orientation. And what this means is that because of how optics work, the image can be upside down or reversed or both, depending on the telescope design. Uh, it's a, just a general uh, characteristic of, of a lens and mirror. So for those who have seen a, you know, the classic old diagrams of a pinhole projector and how it turns the image upside down, it's the same idea here. So with that said, um, there are ways to correct for this, to, uh, for two of the telescope types that we'll talk about. This is kind of just lumping all here to avoid calling it out later. But a uh, refractor, refractors, which are lens orient designs, and uh, cassegrains and catadioptrics, which are both lens plus mirrors, they have, um, without a diagonal, which we'll talk about briefly here in a second, uh, they will uh, project an upside down image. Um, for that, it's not too important for those telescope sites because almost always as a visual observer, will be using a diagonal on a refractor or a catadioptric. I just refer to them as cassegrains um, for the better part of this, just because it's a, a more hard on me to say catadioptric throughout this presentation. Um, so 
the diagonal will be used to put the IP set of more convenient locations. So you won't necessarily have to care about the upside down factor, but it's just letting you know that it's there. Now, this is the opposite of Newtonians, where they will also be upside down, but you, you don't typically use a diagonal on a Newtonian. And so this this will always have the upside down image orientation. Uh, sorry. And uh, it's just something that you may need to be aware of. Uh, if those of you who are working on, say, some of the uh, actual league observing programs for set sketching certain objects in the night sky. Um, it's also worth calling out and trying to recognize if you're looking at star charts and saying, this doesn't look like the same orientation I was expecting, um, or I was expecting it to be this way. Uh, it may it may skew that as you're looking through on Newtonians, just because it has that upside down characteristic or, or inverted characteristic. And the last of the things that we will talk about uh, that are unique are common to all telescopes, some additional secondary factors um, or measures that are useful to know about um, if you're trying to do certain applications like say variable stall observing or um, which I know Doug is a big practitioner of. So they, um, you'll, if you do man have a more recent telescope, you may also be able to pull up um, the specs of that telescope from the manufacturer, or you sometimes a similar scope if your your scope is a U.S. telescope that you got offhand and it's no longer sold, but they might sell something that's comparable. Like for example, an eight-inch Tabsonian is going to have similar statistics as any eight-inch Tabsonian today. Um, refractors might be a little bit more of a ball game to go try to hunt for. Uh, just because there's some uh, specialties about those, which we won't get really into with this presentation. Um, but here, this is an example, which I pulled from Celestron's website. Uh, on, uh, this is from an 8-inch Smith Cassegrain, showing some of the ones that I think are a little bit important to know about. Uh, not necessarily all of them, just because it'd be far too much for this slide. Uh, some of these, which would be important for us, are limiting stellar magnitude, and the uh, resolution, as well as the light gathering power, sorry, the highest useful magnification stats. So kind of going down, starting with the magnific uh, limiting magn stellar magnitude of 14, uh, this is essentially saying that under absolutely perfect skies, in optimal conditions, at a really dark sky, the with dark adapted eyes, you know, this is a perfect hypothetical scenario, the faintest object that you can reasonably make out with this telescope will be of an apparent magnitude 14. So if you are, for some reason, um, engaged in activities where you need to, where, you know, your scope says this has a limiting magnitude of magnitude 11, but you're looking at things that are, um, you know, uh, in Tucson skies, you might not be able to hit magnitude 11 with that. So it's important to look at that statistic to try to give you a reasonable idea. Um, you know, kind of have to think about your sky quality and where you'll be with the scope. Uh, if uh, this scope will allow you to see the details of things you want to see. Whether it's just like, for example, in seeing the fainter areas of some dark nebula uh, or really or really faint galaxies, as where that this this uh, the stellar magnitude is going to really distinguish itself. Jumping next to magnification, for those of us that use visual observing, this gives, gives you a rough idea of what are the lowest powered and highest powered eyepieces that you might be able to use. Since, we, as we talked about last month, eyepieces magnification is dependent on the focal length. So this can require a little bit of napkin math on your part, which is basically telescope focal length uh, divided by my highest, my lowest power eyepiece or my highest power eyepiece. And that tells you if you can or can't use that eyepiece reasonably well with that equipment. Uh, I believe that I, when I did the math for this particular scope, the highest 
magnification eyepiece, the, the, the lowest power eyepiece, which means that the eyepiece with the longest focal length that I could use with a Schmidt category, which would give me the widest field of view, would be a 61 millimeter eyepiece. They don't really make any eyepieces that long, so I don't really have to worry about that. But at highest use of my, highest useful magnification, doing the math to work this out, works out that the the shortest focal length eyepiece that I can use with this scope effectively, not necessarily if it's going to be comfortable to use because of things like exit pupil and eye relief is a three millimeter eyepiece. So yeah, you have to kind of work that math out if you're looking at those factors. Uh, this will probably be more, since I have only didn't really look too much at scopes that report this, um, you know, if I'm using something like a Newtonian or a refractor, these both have uh, lower magnifications, generally speaking, because they're to, because of the optic designs. So, uh, if I'm shopping for a Newtonian and it reports that my it has a focal length of 1,000 millimeters and a highest use of magnification of 250, that tells me that um, my highest useful eyepiece would be what? Sorry, my lowest useful eyepiece would be my shortest focal length eyepiece that I can use. It's always converts me about this because eyepieces are confusing in that way. Is a 2.5 millimeter eyepiece. But the that which would give me my highest level of magnification. Uh, so it's just some math you got to work out there. It's not it's it's very simple math. I'm not going to put the formulas on here because I think we talked about some of them last week. Well, we talked we did talk about them last uh, month with the eyepieces. Uh, so definitely keep those stats in mind and check them out to make sure you know what eyepieces you can actually use with that equipment. The next one we'll talk about is the resolution. And this is saying, uh, is really more important for people who do a lot of binary star, who like observing binary stars, uh, is where this would mostly come into play. Um, also possibly looking at some surface details on planets like Mars, trying to see some um, like Valles Marineris on Mars, resolving details on that or resolving the individual cloud bands on Jupiter or some of the spaces in the rings on Saturn is where the resolution really becomes more important. Also for photography as well, but we'll just get talking about that. And what this is saying with a resolution of 0.69 arc seconds and 0.57 arc seconds is that if I'm looking at a double star, and the distance between the double star, the, the, the main star and the secondary star, is less than 0.69 arc seconds. So it's if I, they're separated by less than one arc second in this case, that in perfect skies, I will not be able to separate them. They will always appear as one object, no matter what eyepiece I put in this telescope. Um, so questions there's kind of a lot in this i didn't really go too much in this like as i figured it was more of a talking point and i should have put more diagrams questions on any of these because they, they sometimes need a picture to help explain and i didn't really do a good job there ah so mark asked how does the use of a 2x or 3x barlow affects the calculation um for the magnification mark are you referring to Or were you referring to resolution when you asked that question? I'll give you a moment to type uh, magnification. Yeah. So, are you asking how does how does a Barlow impact, you know, the calculation of magnification or the calculation of resolution? I will assume magnification, but I just wanted to be sure. Either I think I would be interested in. Uh, so for resolution, I I don't think a, a Barlow will change anything there. I still going. It's not going to suddenly say, oh, I can resolve something that's point three arc seconds because it's 
the resolution is kind of, is driven by the size of the primary mirror or the primary lens, which, which you know, or in our case, the aperture of the scope. Uh, so a a bigger aperture scope has better resolution. Uh, so that won't change there. Uh, for magnification, I don't think it will also change anything there because the Matt Barlow is essentially playing a trick with the focal length. Um, so you're you're only changing the magnification of that eyepiece, not the maximum magnification that's supported by that scope. Um, this will probably be more. This might change on a refractor because it doesn't have a, a secondary mirror. But if you typically, if you get close, the closer you get to the highest use of magnification on a, sorry, the closer you get to the upper limit or lower limit on magnification shown here on a Newtonian or on a Cassegrain, you're going to start seeing that secondary mirror in your eyepiece. We'll start, you'll, you'll see like a giant black spot and be like, what is that? And you're really looking at your secondary mirror that's shooting light back at your eyepiece just because you've, you've, you're you either magnifying too much and you're outside of the, the beam of light that's coming back into the eyepiece from the primary mirror. So good questions. Uh, any other questions on some of these core stats before we move on to actually talking about the telescope types? There's a lot to digest there. That's why I make sure we're all good. Okay. So first up on the list is refractors. Uh, this is a picture of the nine inch folding refractor that we have out at CAC, and uh, despite its um, the, the fact that it has refractor in its name, I almost feel like this should actually be classified as a catadioptric because it uses both a, a lens and a mirror. But that might be more of a semantic argument for somebody who knows more about optics than me to make that. Um, so for the purposes of this, we'll call it a refractor. Uh, so this is the, the classic uh, long tube spyglass telescope that most people get introduced to first throughout grade school when they, we get to Gal Galileo and early European history. These are um, generally workhorse telescopes. They're fairly safe uh, in terms of operation. They're basically a setup and you don't really have to calibrate them in any way. But um, so they are quote unquote less maintenance heavy than a Newtonian or a Cassegrain because it has the none of the mirrors move. Uh, so if you're looking for a gift for kids and you know they might not be taking uh, might be a little bit more animated, uh, these are probably a better scope choice to go with for that age group. Uh, just just um, you really kind of have to be very abusive to these scopes to take them in and have them collimated, which we talked about a couple months ago. Uh, these are primarily driven by lenses, uh, which is the main thing that drives up their cost. Uh, the and that's because it takes a long time and a lot of skill to get that lens that very the larger your piece of glass that you're sticking into that to the front of the scope. It takes a lot more effort to shape that lens and get it perfect, and has to go through a lot more quality controls on it. So that helps drive up that cost there. So the, typically you'll find refractors under six inches. They do make them more than six inches, uh, but those get to be really, really expensive in the range of tens of thousands of dollars expensive. Um, so for beginner level equipment, you're typically looking at something between uh, the you know 100 millimeters and 180 millimeters uh, as a general reasonable size for a refractor that you might be looking at. Um, if you're just starting out with your equipment. Uh, the other thing to know about refractors is they have a what's known as chromatic aberration. And uh, I have some more diagrams to explain what that is here in a couple of slides. Uh, but this is one of several types of distortion that occur in telescopes. This one, uh, it, by its name, is a distortion of colors. 
uh, because um, if, if we remember back to, high, uh, to middle school or high school science class, uh, the lens acts as a prism. And it will separate out colors of light like a prism does. This causes images to um, change noticeably in their color, which is shown here in this image of Jupiter. Uh, one, the top image is on a scope with uh, which has no chromatic aberration. It may be an apochromatic telescope uh, refractor, which we'll talk about briefly here in a second, uh, which corrects for the chromatic aberration. The other one is taken on just a normal refractor that does have chromatic aberration. So you can kind of get a rough distance of the image and what you might see. So the other, the primary thing that brought us able to refractors, besides the fact that they're pretty straightforward to care for, uh, is that because these are generally uh, low magnification scopes, they have an impressively large field of view. But you guys to be um, nice if you might be thinking like, oh, I'm starting out visual now, but I might go to photography in a couple of years. Most people would recommend starting out on a refractor. The wide field and uh, faster focal ratio just makes them a lot easier and more tolerable to work with when you're starting out. Uh, because because these are typically small aperture scopes, they're also very small and very lightweight, so they're very easy to transport. So unlike Newtonians and Cassegrains, which have a little bit more mass to them um, and maybe uh, more space heavy to transport, but they'll still typically weigh, um, even with the Newtonian or a Cassegrain, most of the time they'll weigh underneath 20 pounds just for, for, the, for the tube. The, the exception to that is Dobsonians, uh, which... We'll, I think we'll briefly talk about here in a bit, but won't go too much into depth and into, into those. Uh, another bit of, it, of refractors is that because they're lenses and they don't have a secondary mirror in them, that they will produce a sharper image with better contrast, which means that you'll be able to make out lighter and darker areas more effectively on, say, Jupiter's cloud bands or on some nebulas. Uh, personally, my eyes aren't sensitive enough to really see that distinction uh, clearly uh, from a visual perspective. But I do know that some people have connect will, will make out individual pixel details when I'm showing them designs on the screen. So it, it, you're you're it's sometimes that the distinction of sharpness and contrast can be subjective to you as an individual, but it's still worth calling out. Um, and as I kind of mentioned earlier, because it's just two lenses, the the inside of the tube is closed, so there's only two surfaces that would need to be cleaned or collect dust when the scope is in use. Uh, so, like if you're outdoors, you know you would only maybe have to dust off the uh, the outside of the of the primary lens from time to time, and you just clean it off lightly with a brush or air dust. Um, Newtonians and Cassegrains. Newtonians are a little bit more um, interesting. We'll talk about briefly with that, but it's usually not that big of a deal. But it does mean that they are more resistant to water, uh, which might come out if you're in a uh, playing around outside when it's a lot of when it's a dew heavy night or a high humidity night. Okay. So the general classic diagram of what we all expect a refractor to be. Uh, it just has that front lens. Shit. Find out which mouse I need to use. There it is. It has the front lens up here, which is the given as the aperture. There's going to be a lens here in the back near the eyepiece and the focuser to focus light on the eyepiece. And then the diagonal, which we briefly mentioned, which is <clears throat> I was going to actually do any image inversion and correct that so you're circling back to what we mentioned about for chromatic aberration keep giving this a more clear distinction um the type of refractor that you get that that corrects for chromatic aberration is what's known as an apochromatic or simply just offhand as an apo so as we as we talked about, you know, it has um, with inner refractor, the lens itself acts as a prism, separating out the different colors of light when it wants to reach your eyepiece. 
And what apochromatic refractors do is they introduce a second uh, piece of glass okay. um, or multiple pieces of glass in order to make it so that these beams of light will meet back up together back at the focal length without spreading out as much or nearly as much. So it becomes almost in it uh, so that the chromatic aberration becomes imperceptible to the human eye and to most imaging telescopes, most imaging cameras. Uh, the downside is that that extra glass is going to cost you significantly more. Uh, so uh, the general rule of thumb is often cited if you're looking at a, a, a refractor and you like its specs, but it's not an APO, it's going to cost 10 times more to get that scope as an apochromatic scope. So this could take a $100 refractor uh, to being a $1,000 refractor. Uh, so these are very much one of those, go for the smaller apertures for those that, uh, if you are looking at apochromatic scopes. So we've talked about so far briefly about two different uh, aberrations. We're going to dive a little bit more into those here as kind of a segue. So these are just imperfections in the way your telescope or camera lens will focus light on your eye or the sensor. The two types, excuse me, I need some water. That will crop up most often in conversations or um, for both visual observers and for uh, imaging observers is chromatic coma, chromatic aberration, also known as coma. And this is a distortion of stars near the end of view, edges of the field of view, so that the stars no longer appear round. And I think I have an image coming up here in a bit to show what I mean by that. And then the next um, one, which we also talked, which we talked about just a second ago is chromatic aberration, which is a dispersion of white light into its respective colors, causing color distortion. So chroma as in color, color distortion. Uh, coma is the way I just remember it is it's the one without an R. What, what, what is that? Uh, just another example of a chromatic aberration in action on this image here of the moon. To give you kind of a sense, more of a sense of what it can be, you'll see the top half of the moon appears in red, while the bottom half has a bluish edge to it. It's hinting more um, something to watch out for if you're looking at refractors. And chromatic aberration only occurs in refractors. Versus coma, which will occur in Newtonians and Cassegrains, uh, because coma is an artifact of the mirrors. These give me, excuse me, one second while I go get me some water to save my throat. We'll be right back. Oh, what in the hell is that? Sorry about that, but I could make it this whole without needing that. And then, uh, come on. And this here is an example of coma aberration, which is a distortioning of of stars near the field of view. Um, so, as I mentioned, this is an aberration that occurs uh, due to the primary mirror of a refract of a reflector or a Cassegrain type scope because the mirror is a uh, concave it's bent and so that causes the distortion as it gets farther away towards the towards the outer edge of the light beam so both both Newtonians and uh Cassegrains will have this distortion it's more pronounced I'm told on Newtonians 
I haven't really paid much of attention to it. I normally don't notice it when I do it when I'm out at CAC looking through other people's Dobsonians or Newtonians doing the visual observing. Um, but I do notice it in images, even in images on my own system, which I use a Cassegrain, grain. So I do see coma on those. Uh, so just something to keep in mind. You can buy, um, as I kind of mentioned very early when we talked about back focus, you can buy what's known as a coma corrector, which will smooth out this distortion uh, versus, and which is an aftermarket accessory you can get. But, the, uh, the, uh, but chromatic aberration cannot be corrected through a aftermarket accessory. You have you can only correct that by purchasing an apochromatic refractor. Questions or comments before we move on? Okie dokie. From there, we'll move on to reflectors. Uh, which, you know, by their name, you know, they use mirrors. Uh, these are much simpler and generally cheaper telescopes compared to uh, in an aperture for aperture comparison compared to a refractor. The trade-off that you make with that, uh, which depending on who you ask is a big deal or isn't a big deal, is that they require a little bit more regular maintenance in terms of collimation. Um, the mirror at the back of the scope on a reflector will tend to shift after transporting it, you know, to, if you're going out, um, doing regular stargazing, like, you know, if you have to drive to any of our dark sites. So, uh, the, um, they tend, because of the, uh, their cost and size, uh, you can generally get a ref a, a, ref uh, a refractor at the same aperture significantly cheaper than you can get a refractor than sorry you can get a reflector slash Newtonian at a higher aperture cheaper than you can get a refractor at that same aperture. So an eight inch Newtonian will cost less significantly than an eight inch refractor. Uh, The uh the I think the main thing that comes to be uh, a drawback in this scope design uh, for visual observers tends to be the location of the eyepiece. So as we mentioned, as I mentioned briefly, when talking about um, image inversion, you don't typically use a diagonal when looking through a Newtonian. It's more weight on the side of the scope. Uh, so it can cause the, the mount to move. But because of that, depending on the type of mount you use, uh, so uh, this can make it so that the eyepiece gets put into a hard-to-reach position when you're looking in certain areas of the sky. So, for example, if you're looking through a big uh, daub, it will be um, more challenging to look through that daub on objects that are closer to zenith in the night sky because the scope is standing almost straight up and its eyepiece is all the way up near the front of the telescope, which generally means that you need a ladder to reach it. Uh, for smaller daubs uh, or Newtonians, like the you know, six to eight inches, which are commonly used on the mounts that we'll see, it's typically not that big of a problem uh, uh, on certain types of mounts. It's more pronounced on gem mounts, German equatorial mounts, which we'll talk about mounts here at the end of this, um, and why that can be uh, a consideration uh, for those. If you are if you like to engage in star party um, outreach activities with the club, um, eyepiece location is certainly something that you should try to keep in mind when you're looking at objects or selecting objects for that uh, for for an event or just to look at um because you might end up being like have to contort underneath the bottom of the scope to to get your uh your eye to the eyepiece depending on it 
as I've mentioned multiple times by now, they're also affected by uh, uh, coma aberrations, which is just the, the distortion of stars near the rims. This is your typical Newtonian reflector setup. You have the primary mirror in the back, which is what's doing all the light gathering, and then a secondary mirror near the top, which is projecting the, the light out to your eyepiece. And as you can see, this tube side is fixed on the side of the scope, which is what I was trying to mention when, you know, if this tube, it gets, let's imagine that this is pointing up here to the night sky right now on one side of the, um, during when you're pointing at something to the east, but on the west side of the sky, this might be reversed. And so that your eyepiece is now pointed directly at the ground. So you kind of have to bend over significantly to go look at that eyepiece. This is where the, um, and as you can also see in this, the mirror here is curved in order to reflect light on the primary mirror, on the secondary mirror so that it reaches your eyepiece. And it's this curvature of the mirror that causes the coma aberrations. So you versus, uh, so it's not something, something um, it, it's going to happen in any Newtonian you choose. So if you like having regular Newtonians doing certain types of viewing, it may be worthwhile just to buy a coma corrector so that you have it for multiple reasons. Uh, the other, from a care standpoint, in addition to collimation, refractors are open aired systems, which means that the whole surface of the scope will collect dust while the scope is in use. Um, so they will require periodic cleaning um, occasionally to just get the dust off of this, all the surfaces, such as you know the secondary mirror or the primary mirror generally are the only ones you really need to concern with, but you'll have to clean them more regularly than say a refractor just because of the open air nature. I say frequent regularly it could just be like a once a year or every other year sort of thing that you would have to do it's not like i have to clean my telescope every six months or every three months um but you're, you're one of those people that's just really picky and likes having clean equipment the benefit of uh these in addition to their cost is um they will all generally have faster f ratios compared to a refractor um, so this generally means that it's you're um, quicker to pick out fainter and fuzzier objects on a Newtonian than you would be on a refractor um, just because of that focal speed difference. But they'll also have more magnification typically uh, because they have a larger aperture, which also helps with the focal length. So, you know, just to let show things to think about. Um, and a special call out for Dobsonian's mounts um, and I think some people in this can chime in more on this than I can, but eyepiece weight becomes a consideration oh, for Dobsonian refractors because they are on their mounts are free floating. They don't have motors. They're just you can move them with your hand. And so having a very heavy eyepiece, um, like you might have with a really big uh and heavy nagler will uh, cause the scope to sometimes fall and hit the ground. So you, um, eyepiece weight is also something you, you'll need to consider with refractor, with uh, Newtonians and reflectors in general. Uh, if you're, if you are, uh, if you are in possession of a dob. Uh, uh, any other, any question, any comments on refractors? I don't, I, reflectors, ugh, both times are similar and tongue tying myself. Uh, but um, I don't actually own one of these, so I don't know if there's any other advice that people um, might want to chime into from their experience on a reflector that they might want to consider sharing um, for people who are looking. We're about almost done. Hopefully I can speed this up. And lastly, we come to what's probably at this point one of the more common telescope purchases that first-time buyers will get. Uh, it's uh, the cataractric or the general Cassegrain. Uh, 
these scopes will use the combination of both lenses and mirrors. They have very high magnifications in general. Um, and as the starting magnification, uh, the starting focal length of an eight inch SCT or Cassegrain is 2000 millimeters compared to what you might be about 1000 or 12 or 1200 millimeters on an eight inch Newtonian. Okay. Uh, so very high powerful, very high power magnification. The downside is, is that Cassegrains, because of this high magnification and they're basically a really compact scope have very slow uh, f ratios they're um, an eight inch acid grain it has an f10 focal ratio and and an f uh a 14 inch cast grain which is not this is something you should be transporting um regularly will have you know an f11 to f12 focal ratio yeah, so these are very very yeah. optically slow telescopes um but they still do a really great job they, they pack a, a lot of magnification in a very small body They'll also they'll generally be slightly more expensive than a refractor because it has um, a lens element to it, that corrector plate, which is not shown uh, at the front of the scope, which is both uh, holds the secondary mirror as well. So, uh, but, you know, you can still get just uh, an eight inch cement cassette grain, just the tube itself for about $1,200. So they're still, you know, they're not terribly expensive for the size. Yes, very versatile, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. If you're willing to deal up with the uh, the the speed and the magnification, uh, so this is just a, a typical optical diagram um, showing you know you have light entering up here at the front of the scope through this corrector plate. This is on the left hand side. The red sticker here. So this is showing a Muscatov. So, uh, Cassegrain scope, which, uh, unlike the uh, the Smith Cassegrain down here and below, it doesn't have a mirror. It's actually more of a reflective sticker on the inside of the corrector plate, okay. uh, and that reflects light back out towards the to to the end of the telescope and the eyepiece. Versus down here, which is the Smith Cassegrain on the bottom, which has uh. Uh, yeah. a mounted cutout inside of the corrector plate to hold the secondary mirror. Uh, the the trade-off between these two is that on a Muscatov, because the secondary mirror is essentially a stickered surface, it doesn't require collimation. Uh, versus a smith cassegrain would sometimes require collimation uh, for, you know, if you transport it a lot, uh, or it can get shifted if it gets hit really hard. Uh, so this can cause a, a cement cast grain to require collimation as well, uh, like a Newtonian. If you have to collimate a muscatop refractor with uh, a telescope like this one, it's generally the rule of thumb is like, it's like a refract refractor, take it into a specialist shop. Don't, don't try to collimate a muscatop on your own. It's, not worth it. And finishing up here with choices of mount. So uh, when you're looking at a mount, there are a lot of things you want to consider. There's a lot of things you'll look at, but some of the main ones you want to look at are how much weight can this telescope hold? Uh, off, you know, you're looking at your first telescope you know, you you might say, oh, hey, I like this mount, but the optics on it aren't that great. I don't like the scope for this particular purpose. I want to put a new scope on it that can let me, you know, do planetary observing better or do imaging better. Uh, so looking at the weight tells you what's the largest um, piece of equipment you can put on it. How much does the mount itself weigh? Uh, if you're, you know, uh, a mobile uh, astronomer, having to go out to set up a dark sky site or for star party um, events, you know, you're going to carry this thing out, set it up. So, you know, a heavy, heavy duty, really heavy mount, not necessarily something you want to lug around all that much. So you might want a lighter mount, which has a lower, lower um, weight capacity on it as well. Uh, 
just to have something that gets you around to move. It's easier to set up and to somehow and have or and maybe you know if you're really fancy have a second mount that's more heavy duty that you permanently set up somewhere you take out um, to really dark sky sites like say CAC. Um, also consideration is the rail type. Uh, and I'll sh give the, the next a picture I on my the next slide will I I'll point out what they mean by that. Um, most teles all the telescopes. Uh, will generally have what's known as a rail that allows you to slide on and attach the scope to the mount. Uh, there's different types of uh, rails out there, so like, for example, uh, the Vixen dovetail. Uh, and it's worth checking to see uh, what type of dovetail your mount has. Sometimes they'll have a universal adapter so that it'll, uh, it'll support multiple uh, dovetail rail types. Uh, but if you choose a mount that only supports one dovetail rail type, uh, that also tells you what scopes you can or cannot add or put on that mount. So something to keep in mind there. And for those choosing a go-to set uh, scope, uh, a go-to uh, mount, uh, what type of mounts, uh, sorry, ports, and connectors does it have for other accessories that you might use, such as um, but that's typically more for people who are doing photography. It's a larger consideration there. Um, and g going back into the way, how easy is that is that mount to set up with your scope on it once you get out to a site? This leads to the first mount we'll talk about, which is what's known as a German equatorial mount. These mounts are the really distinctive ones. They have, uh, they're typically angled like this image here, and they have a whole bunch of counterweights on one end and heavy and the scope on another. And they rotate around this central axis. These scopes are generally, uh, can be very, I want to use more involved to set up and tear down, uh, mostly because you have the counterweight here on the front. You have, you know, this whole, this is a very heavy duty mount. They make smaller ones than this, but you have counterweights, the counterweight bar. You have to polar align the scope. You have to, because these scopes always have to be facing towards close to Polaris in order to align them. Uh, uh, and it's just a little bit more going on in terms of mechanics that you have to kind of adjust to when using the scope. Um, depending on who you ask, they can also be a little bit more portable uh, than some Altaz mounts, which is the second type of mount we'll talk about here in a second. Uh, but, but the benefit of these is um, mainly for, is one, they're really good, preferred for imaging. You basically have to use an equatorial mount if you you know, say, hey, I'm doing visual now, but I might be doing imaging in a couple of years or something. Uh, so uh, typically starts there. The, uh, I'm trying to what we're going to say here. Um, the other benefit is that most equatorials are generally designed from the out, from the get-go to accept other telescopes. This is not necessarily true of alt as telescopes. Long space for. So, because of how these scopes operate, they don't look up, down, left, right, like we would normally look, like we would normally expect to look at. They kind of follow the astronomical coordinate systems of right ascension and declination. Mm -hmm. uh, this uh, can also come significantly into play with eyepiece position. Uh, Mm, sorry. The other thing is that these mounts do not um, work well if your object is close to the meridian or directly um, directly on that point that separates the north and south, the east and west sides of the sky. And the reason for that here is this counterweight. So in order to look at things directly overhead, 
the scope is essentially you have the counterweights jutting out one side level and the scope level on the other. So this can cause slight imbalances uh, in the scope, but also depending on the, what it's mounted on here, this is on just a portable pier, uh, you might end up having your scope start butting up against the legs of your tripod um, when you start looking at things on the meridian. So something to just know about and be aware of with equatorials. On the other side of that, we have all thaz mounts, uh, which are generally what might be referred to as a fork mount, where you have two, you know, edges of a fork that hold the telescope in place. Um, these can be all are generally a lot easier to set up in the field. They don't require. There's typically just take the tripod out, take the the fork mount with the scope on it and set that on the tripod and then start looking at things. Uh, there's no need like a, an equatorial mount to point it specifically to the North Pole to align it. It's just set it up and go. So they're very quick to set up and turn out. Um, the the trade-off for that is that most of the time when you buy an Altas, a fork mount specifically, um, and some other Altas mounts is that you cannot replace swap out to usually cannot swap it out to a new scope or different sizes so this fork mount here is specifically designed for this eight inch smith cassegrain if you you could not put a newtonian on this scope on this mount they are a mated pair so you can get you can get uh, all test mounts that will accept other scopes but you need to look at that specifically you know Oh, sorry, I didn't see Galen's uh, question. So Galen asks, can a SMIC cast be manually adjusted for collimation? Yes. So uh, if you, on the front end of the secondary mirror, Galen, there are little screws on it that are used to adjust the tilt of that secondary mirror. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, unfortunately, you can't use collimation accessories like the uh, like you would on a Newtonian to collimate them, so they can be a little bit trickier in that regard. Um, typically, I would say um, I've only I've had my Smith Cassegrain for close to six years now, and I've only had it collimated once, so they don't. It's not it's not something that you need to do nearly as often as you would as say a Newtonian, which you might have to collimate. You know every other observing session if you're if you're moving the scope from different sites or to different star parties. Um, my recommendation is if you think your your Smith Cassegrain does need to be collimated, and you live here in Tucson, I would just take it down to Star Arizona. Uh, they uh, when I had it collimated, it was just a fifty dollar fee, and they collimated it there in the shop and they give it back to you. It's also typically you could just get it up there for a, a touch up if you are needing it, like say cleaning the corrector plate and other things. Getting back to all pass mounts. Yes, Star Arizona. Getting back to all pass mounts. So um, putting other scopes on it. That's where I was. So uh, just be aware, if you are purchasing an all pass mount, you, you're wanting to grow your scope collection over time for different purposes. Um, just keep in mind that you may want to look at a mount that accepts other scope types. But it might also be that you're just looking for a scope that you're using specifically for star party events. And so you're fine with, you know, a mated pair where you, you're you not going to be swapping out to different telescopes on that particular mount. But definitely something to keep in mind. The other benefit um, of wedge mounts, of sorry, of fork mounts or altas mounts, is that you can use an accessory of what of what's known as a wedge which allows you to, uh, which basically takes the wedge, the fork mount. I have a picture later on, I think, showing a wedge mount, which uh, basically allows you to take a fork mount and kind of sort of turn it into an equatorial mount. Uh, if you've been out to Tempa, one of our dark sky sites, and looked through the 14-inch scope there, that is on a wedge mount. And there's also several scopes at CAC that are mounted there now that are also on wedge mounts. Um, the benefit of those is, you know, you get a little bit, you can take an Altas mount and use it for photography. It's generally what you get a wedge accessory for, but it also, um, 
because it tilts the scope, it can make the eyepiece make it easier to reach the eyepiece in certain positions in the night sky. So it makes, you know, for larger for larger scopes, it can help make it make that a little bit more user friendly. Um, the downside is by adding on that wedge, you add the same alignment constraints as an equatorial, where now your your all task mount on a wedge has to be polar aligned. So it's I would consider it as an ad, an advanced accessory. Yeah. So uh, some of this I've already hit on. Um, they're generally easier to set up and tear down um, because um, they're used to up, down, left, right you know, movements. You'll you'll generally keep the eyepiece in a spot that's easy to access, uh, which is not necessarily true for equatorial mounts. So typically, so much. I generally say they're a much user, much more beginner friendly in that particular setup. The the main trade-off with an alt das, other than the fact that they're not really suitable for photography, if that's going to be your thing in the long term, uh, is their dead zones uh, uh, are at zenith, directly overhead, um, directly at the very top of the sky. And that's because if we go back to this picture here, uh, when you're looking directly overhead, the scope is pointed straight up. And so your eyepiece, it, it kind of has this dead circle zone. So where it can't, you know, move the motors enough to point out something um, that close to the top. It is just, it's like, you know, trying to take a, a straw and balance it on one end in your cup. It's just going, it can't, it, it, it fiddles around it. It can't find positions as well. The other thing to think about is that also when it's pointed uh, directly at Zenith on a Smit caster grain like this, is the eyepiece might actually run up and hit the bottom of this truss here. It might stick out too far. So you, you'll you have to kind of eyeball that as well. Uh, one other complaint that I've also had uh, happen to a couple of club members is that, um, depending on the where the battery, the power source plugs in, is that you can wind up having the battery power cable wrap around the scope throughout the night. And in one unfortunate event I was at, uh, the person wasn't paying attention to this and had their power cable strip out and snap on them. Uh, so something also to keep in mind of that. Uh, so here is a picture of a of a fork mount on a wedge. Uh, so this is that that wedge body. You can kind of see down here. It's on you know the whole fork mount is essentially pivoted, but it's still that same fork mount. And finishing up here, almost at the end, this is the last couple of slides. Is the decision about do I get a push to scope or a go to scope? So. A push to scope is exactly what it sounds like. There's no motors involved. You simply you take your hand and you move the scope to where you want to look at in the night sky. Very simple. Uh, no power sources other than you know maybe some food snacks on your hand to help you know give you some energy over the night. Uh, these are because you essentially you're pushing it with your hand. It slews as fast as your hand can move it. The downside of this is that if you aren't very familiar with the night sky and you're saying, oh, I want to go look at this thing, uh, you need to take, you need to uh, use uh, star charts and certain observing techniques like star hopping in order to locate things. Uh, uh, you don't have a computer to reference. You have to, to say, go here to this point. You have to know where the thing is in the night sky. You know how to be able to find it. So this could be a challenging for people who are just starting out um, but it's also in itself, some would argue that that's the reason they want to is because they want to learn more about the night sky. Uh, so with a go-to scope, you don't necessarily get that aspect of the hobby. You just say, I'm just going to go to this night's, this position and go look at something. Uh, so, you know, that's not necessarily a pro or a con. It, you know, it's generally very much a personal preference if you do want to go a push to route. Um, 
The other thing, uh, because you they also they don't have a computer, is that if you're operating in light polluted skies, you may not be able to. It, it'll, it gets a little bit trickier to find certain uh, deep sky objects because some of the stars you may have used at a at a darker site to find something may not be visible in the light pollution, or at the at the or at the site you're currently at, just because there's a lot more background light. Um, Because these don't have any tracking motors, these are not photography type mounts. Push shoes are purely visual. Uh, but because of that, they're also you know, like an Altas mount and a Dapsonian. They're very quick to set up and tear down. You just put the scope on it and off you go. There's no alignment process, no power to fiddle with, no confusing controls. You just point it and go. Although, uh, often sometimes I've heard they're referred to as the point here dummy telescopes. Now, go-to mounts, on the other hand, are the exact opposite of that. They require they require a dedicated power source because they have motors in it, as well as a hand controller, or in some cases now a phone, app, a dedicated app for an iPad or, a, or an iPhone uh, to align the scope so that it knows where it is so that it can... Uh, triangulate its position so it knows where to go find things in the night sky. Now, this can make finding these sky objects. No, oh, okay. Oh, uh, this can make finding objects a um, little bit more rewarding um, or easier to find. You know, if I want to say, hey, I want to go find, you know, this globular cluster in Pegasus. Where is it? Uh, you just tell the scope to go to, like, say, Messier 15, which is one of the globular clusters in Pegasus, and it just goes there. You don't have to worry about a Telrad, star hopping, or consulting other star charts on you in order to go find the object. The trade-off of that is, the, in order to align the scope, you need to have some knowledge about what certain stars are and where they are in the sky. Most of the time, they will say, hey, I'm going to slew to, say, CAF, C-A-P-H, which is the star in Cassiopeia. Uh, but I won't tell you it's in Cassiopeia. It'll just say, here's the star name. And so you kind of have to know where that star is so that you can say, hey, this isn't what I would have expected for CAF. It's much too dim. It's not pointing in the right area of the sky um, in order to figure out that your scope may not is aligning correctly. Uh, so there's still some knowledge of the night sky you have to learn. Um, uh, they, because uh, they have motors and electronics, they are more costly than a push to scope. And the motors also generally mean that they will slew to targets much slower. And as Galen uh, pointed out in the chat, um, these can also, go-to systems can also be used in a push to mode. Um, some of them will have clutches on them that will allow you to move the scope freely, uh, treat it as a push to, if you wanted to do that. So you, you can kind of get a combination of both depending on the go-to mount you choose. Um, yeah. Uh, so Scott asked, what does the GPS contribute to, on go-to alignment? So the GPS... Uh, account tells is only used to tell your scope where it is on earth and where and what the date and time is uh the position on the earth uh is used so um, as you go you know north or south across the earth's surface the the position of things in the night sky will change so you know if you're say in new york polaris is much higher up in the night sky than it is here in tucson so it needs to know your position on the earth so that it says, okay, you're at 32 degrees north latitude, which means that Polaris is going to be roughly 32 degrees off the horizon. So if you didn't have your location reasonably close to where your position is, if like say, hey, I accidentally, I was up at the Grand Canyon, you know, last week, and then I drove back to Tucson, but my scope is still set up for the Grand Canyon, and you're trying to go find things. Well, your scope's going to be off by three degrees if you try to go and wind something. Because there's a three degree latitude difference between the Grand Canyon and Tucson. Uh, 
So that's what the, the so the, that's one thing you need the GPS for. It helps just automate that, so you don't have to keep injuring it every time. And the date and time also is used um, for the GPS just so that you also don't have to enter it. It's more of a convenience to have a GPS accessory. Yeah. Um, it just it just saves you a step of entering those when you start the hand paddle. You don't you don't need it necessarily. You can still get your phone. There's apps out there that'll tell you your latitude, longitude, and the date time with high precision. Um, so if you should scope if your mount comes with it, great. But it, you know don't you don't you don't necessarily need it. Um, the other thing um, you want to add um, on go-to mounts is you may also find accessories such as Celestron's Star Sense uh, to make this, to automate the alignment process. I don't have a dedicated slide on this. Uh, so, but what the Star Sense is, is it's basically another as a, a separate camera and finder scope that connects, that you mount on your your tube, like your Cassegrain or your Newtonian. And what it does is it takes a picture of the stars in its field of view and does software in order to figure out where it's pointed in the night sky. And so by using the star sense, you cut out the need for having to know where things are know what the names of alignment stars are and where they are in the night sky so it makes that that lowers the knowledge barrier there at the cost of you know you're adding uh more software into your scope and if you're you know, can if you're on the learning process and not familiar with the equipment can cause some interesting troubleshooting behavior um but i do know several members in the club that do have star sense and they use it for star parties um, and it, so it's great to just, um, I'm told they work reasonably well in finding uh, visual objects. Leads us over to, so again, that's, all, that's also an added expense. Uh, I think the star sense costs like $300 as an add-on accessory. So, you know, if you're shopping on a budget, something to consider there. But they do exist, so it does make, you know, it does offset that, that uh, knowing the night sky barrier for uh, go-to systems. And the last thing, this is the very last slide. This is a, wow, this has been an hour and a half presentation. Not expected to be that long. Um, is mobile device controls. Uh, so th this is more of a, they exist. Um, your mileage may vary sort of on mobile device controls. There's a couple of considerations to with these. Well, the primary being um, some um, sub mounts may require you to have an iPad um, in order to use the scope. They do not have a dedicated hand controller. Uh, they are aligned purely through iPad software. These types of mounts uh, will connect via Wi-Fi to your iPad. They'll basically have a, a little Wi-Fi radio on it instead of Bluetooth or Bluetooth. Um, and you have to use the iPad touchscreen in order to align it. Um, having uh, with one member of the club, I do know that does have this. Um, he has mixed results in this. Um, the iPad typically disconnects frequently on him and messes up with the alignment. Um, it also typically will want to, it doesn't really, in an effort to try to make it simpler to use, it's more constrained on where it points to in the sky for alignment stars. Um, so for those that are more experienced and do know a bit about the night sky, they'll be like, it should, I want to point to this star because it's easier to find for alignment and the iPad software um, because it's more constrained, won't let you do that. Uh, so definitely, if you are looking at a scope and it is one that's controlled by a mobile device, this is much, very much read the reviews and look through some YouTube videos about how to use the iPad software before you use the purchase, before you purchase the mount, because uh, it can be a hit or miss on how you use it more so than you would with one that has a classical hand paddle controller. The other thing that um to consider with uh, the ios uh with mobile device controlled 
is that uh, unlike a hand paddle, your iPad has a, has a, a you are reliant on a software on that needs to go on a device when you can't that has to be maintained by a third party. So if you know, say five years down the road, um, the company that made your telescope mount says, hey, we're no longer supporting this software because we don't have the resources to do that anymore. And then the next year they release a new iPad model and the app won't work on that iPad model, uh, you're stuck. Um, definitely, it's definitely one of those long-term lifetime things that can happen. Um, you know, for example, Google is notorious for killing online web services that people enjoy. Uh, so definitely something that you may want to keep in mind uh, if you are going with an iPad uh, or mobile controlled device. Is, you know, there is a lifetime to that software measured in years. And the software that's working today uh, may no longer be supported in five years and break your telescope. So there are a couple of comments, and this is the the last slide. Um, so that's be it. But there are also uh, two comments. Uh, if I could ask Galen. If he had it to do over again, would he buy a six incher because of the weight? My question is about the sweet spot between light gathering and weight. So uh, I don't think Galen has a mic, so he may have a moment to type his question while he does. Hey, uh, David. Or whoever asked that question? It was David. Uh, and you hear yeah. Me? Yes. Yeah, I can hear uh, you. Thanks. So so yeah, weight is an issue, but you can get um large dobs that don't weigh that much. They they have truss tubes instead of a full blown tube tube. They're just trusses. And so the only weight is the mirror box. Uh, it only weighs like 20, 20 pounds. I've got a 10 inch and it's real easy to handle. So, uh, you know, you, you can get large mirrors in a mirror box with a truss tube for a dob and you can get a large aperture. So to kind of chime in for what Robert responded to, if you're looking to support star party events with the club, um, or, or very short observing sessions, a six inch or an eight inch are reasonable uh, are reasonable things to to go around and portably and move portably. Uh, ten inch and eleven inch Newtonians. Um, there's a little bit extra weight involved with them and setting up, as we Doug had mentioned. Um, so you know they they it do enter that you know more of a hassle to tear to lug around range. Um, they're but not. They're, they're actually very easy. My 10-inch truss tube takes me just five minutes to set up and five minutes to tear down. And um, none of the components may, like I said, the mirror box is the heaviest component, and that only weighs around 20 pounds. And it's small enough that I have to put it on top of a stool in order for adults to be able to look through the eyepiece without bending over. It's a F five. Yeah. Um. So also, David. Uh, I don't know if you. So Galen's response in the chat was that in retrospect, he would use um his current uh, current scope he has, which is a seventy pound reflector. I would assume, in a dome set up, and definitely have something lighter lighter for star parties. So, yeah. Uh, if your scope itself and mount, if your scope weighs, um, you want to keep the, I would say a reasonable weight for a scope if you're engaged in star party events is 20 pounds or less, which is, you know, slightly more than the weight of a gallon of milk. Uh, 
um, anything heavier than that, and it gets to be, yeah, you just don't sometimes. So like, I don't care to get that scope out of the park. Um, so you know, under twenty pounds if you're doing a lot of star party events, or if you move around a lot to different locations to set up your equipment. Um, if you're one of those like, hey, I'm going out to a dark sky site for you know three days, you know, you know, it's it's up to you. There's not really a rule of thumb there. Um, Scott's question is in reference to choosing a mount uh, for someone who's currently doing astrophotography, uh, new, uh, visual observing, but might want to migrate to astrophotography. He's got an SCT. Yeah. Uh, um, I'm just reading over his question. So if you would like to... so. The choice is, do I, if I think I'm going to get into photography, should I go with an equatorial mount uh, versus an Altas mount for my first scope? Um, I would say it's definitely worth it to try to learn a German equatorial if you are sh absolutely sure you're going to go into photography um, with that same equipment. Like if you're saying, hey, I'm going to... Uh, use the same smith Cassegrain, you know, for, for photography. But I would also say um, that smith Cassegrains, uh, from a photography perspective, if you don't have a hyperstar on it, um, can be much more challenging to image with uh, because they have such a high magnification without a hyperstar. And that creates a lot of very small minutia challenges you have to deal with. You just have to learn to cope with them. I've been imaging at F at F10 on a Smith Cassegrain the entire time I've had the equipment. Um, I'm very used to it at this point, but it it has been a lot of like I don't like how this is going. It's a lot of fine tuning that I had to learn in order to use my German Equatorial on my Smith Cassegrain at F10 and take decent pictures. It it it's a much deeper learning curve to use an S uh, a, a German equatorial and an SCT together, just because of you know there's pickiness in a German equatorial, but there's also pickiness in the magnification of a Smith Cassegrain at that at that. Um, Newtonians and refractors are um, refractors are much easier to use if you're just beginning astrophotography. So if you've got a German equatorial and a refractor, um, you'll have a lot more forgiving and error and um bad polar alignment and other things i would say it is but if you I'm, if you are interested in national photography i would say it is worth it to pursue an equatorial mount as your first choice um just well, because connor i also made the suggestion to him that if he's gonna go with an sct think about a double fork on a wedge it works. It it does work. And it the does only... have advantages over the German Equatorial in some regards. It does. Um the in my opinion, I will stress opinion, it I find it easier to polar line an equatorial mount precisely than a than polar aligning precisely a fork mount. That is, of course, your opinion. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a, I'm a wedge fork guy, so I would actually say the opposite. We, we will forever <laughs> agree to disagree on that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, but to to wedge or to equatorial gets to sometimes be both a personal choice and an academic question. Um, if you're if you have an alt test mount and it can support. And it's a go-to scope, and its hand controller supports um, a wedge configuration. There, there are some Altas mounts that don't support a wedge configuration, despite having the ability to do so in the software. So double check if you do have an Altas mount, and you're saying, "Hey, I want to put a wedge on this." Double check um, in your hand controller documentation that there's a setting that you can use to tell it, "Hey, I'm in a wedge configuration, and you should point differently." If your if your hand control paddle on an Altas doesn't have that capability. Uh, and then you then getting a wedge is pointless because it won't ever point to the things in the right sky. If possible, try them both out. See which one you like. Yeah. Um, let's see, uh, on that segue, Doug, do we have any um, 
I, equatorial mounts currently go to equatorials in the the Warner program right now. I don't think well, I think most of our stuff is Dobbs. Um, we have uh, the Gila Monster as a go to equatorial. <clears throat> No, the Gila Monster is an all Daz Equatorial. No, it is not. That's that's on a wedge. But uh, yeah, Ralph and, and Steve just spent a lot of time polar aligning it. Right. It's it's an all Daz, not an Equatorial. No, it's on a wedge. An equ a German Equatorial mount is not the same as a wedge as a wedge mount. It's they a double fork things. on a wedge. It's not an as L. It's it's an Equatorial mount. It is equatorial mounted. It can be used for imaging. It's on a wedge. Uh, to 16... me, a, a wedge to me, a, a wedge and an equatorial mount are distinct things. They are not the same. An equatorial mount is any mount that tracks, uh, that counteracts the rotation of the Earth. There's German equatorial, and it's a and it's a double fork and a wedge is an equatorial mount also. It's not an Azal mount. Let's put it that way. It is an equatorial mount. It's not a German equatorial mount. It's just a double fork mount on a wedge. Um, the 16 inch is going to be as L mounted, not going to be put on a wedge. Um, in terms of what we have in our inventory out there, I don't think we have any equatorial mounted scopes. We have a bunch of dobs, which are as L, and then we got. Ralph has two or three 11 inch Schmidt cast grains and he's got an eight inch mead. They're all as out, no wedges. But I have a Celestron eight in the barn that's on a wedge. So that one can be used for equatorial work. But um, it's not ready yet. I'm still trying to get one piece for it. So, um, so the, uh, uh, also on that front, this week at Tempa. Um, is the official star party night for Tempa, where I will be out there with my equatorial mount as well. But I also believe uh, Stephen and Doug will yeah, also I, be out at Tempa. I'll be uh, out there. For, if you do need help with equipment, we'll also just want to uh, set up your equipment and get some help and hands-on experience with that, or to ask questions about um, you know my experiences with an equatorial mount and imaging. I'll be out there this weekend on both nights. Um, if that is something you wanted to come out and just get more, get more opinions on that I can go through here recently because we've been at this almost an hour and a half now, and my throat hurts. So Scott, definitely, if you if you do have more um, more questions on imaging, you know, or or uh, German equatorial mounts, I will be out there and at Tempo, and you can ask me all you want. Um. That. I'm teaching my fundamentals class at the end of February, or sorry, at the end of March and early. <clears throat> sorry, I said it wrong. Last weekend of February, first two weekends of March are the scheduled days for my fundamentals class. We spend a good four or five hours talking about the different kinds of telescopes and the different kinds of mounts. So if you want more information, feel free to sign up for the class. I actually bring um, in all the different kinds of telescopes and I'll have the different kinds of mounts there so you can look at them. I'm actually signed up for that class already when okay. we come down to Tucson, so I'm anxious to participate in it. Thank you, Doug. Very good. Um, this week, tomorrow, when I'm out at Timpa, I might also be cleaning the corrector plate on the Gila Monster. Uh, so if anyone wants to learn how to clean corrector plates on their Schmidt Cassegrains, I can show you how to do it if you don't already know. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and end the recording here when I find the button. <laughs> and that's going to...